right now, all the Bitcoin in the world could fit right here. Now, I don't have any on my phone. Don't SIM swap me. People have tried. I don't keep it on my phone. Don't worry. But I can send you Bitcoin with a couple clicks of a button instantaneously anywhere around the world down to one one hundred millionth of a Bitcoin. So there are 2.1 quadrillion Satoshis in the world, which is why I'm hashtag 2.1 quadrillion in my- It just, it just made Twitter. sense. I never really thought about it. Yeah. Your Twitter name. Yeah, yeah, 2.1 quadrillion. That's, that's me. I mean, because yeah. ultimately we're not gonna talk about the price of Bitcoin. We're gonna talk about Satoshis. Mark Yusko recently shed light on the profound scalability and divisibility of Bitcoin. Interestingly, he emphasized that the entire global supply of Bitcoin could fit right in your mobile device. With just a few clicks, Bitcoin can be sent across the globe, down to one one hundred millionth of a Bitcoin, which are known as Satoshi. Currently, there are 2.1 quadrillion Satoshi in existence. Why does this matter? As we move forward, the conversation around Bitcoin is expected to shift from its price in dollars to Satoshis. This paradigm shift reflects Bitcoin's inherent design to accommodate microtransactions and promote a decentralized financial ecosystem. If you're new here, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and give us a like if you find the information valuable. Let's get started. When you start talking about exponential growth, that's when people really get messed up because the simplest example, if I take 20 linear steps, I'm at the other side of my office, right? If I take 20 yep. exponential steps, I high five you twice. Let's go. go around <laughs> the world twice. Superpower. And so when we start talking about exponential growth and we start talking about trillions, like we just approved a bill here in the United States, $1.2 trillion yeah. spending bill, a trillion. Like you and I would have to sit here together <laughs> for 31,710 years. That's a long time. And we got to spend a dollar every second. That's one trillion. And so it becomes unreal. So when I say that the price of Bitcoin will easily, I think without even trying hard, go to $500,000, yeah. the having does this amazing thing. So what the having does, is it changes the fair value. Well, why? Well, because if you think about it, the miners, their costs are fixed. Electricity cost, miners, miner cost. And so when the halving occurs and the block rewards get cut in half, in theory, a whole bunch of miners have to go out of business unless the price rises. So what we've seen in every cycle up to this point is a doubling of the fair value to adjust for the decrease in block rewards. Makes sense. But that movement that's built in, hard-coded in, in the code from Satoshi himself, that code then attracts attention. And, you know, it's not politically popular, but true. The vast majority of people who are traders happen to be male. Males have genetically back to our long distance ancestors, the hunter gene, right? And so if someone were to walk by my door out there, out, out there right? I would look. And yeah. if it ain't moving, I can't see it. My, my wife says, get the ketchup. I go to the refrigerator, honey, there's no ketchup. She walks up, grabs the ketchup. It's not moving, I can't see it. So my point is once that price starts moving, all the traders, mostly male, pile in. And then the gamblers come in and the speculators and they lever up. And then we get to the overpriced level, usually 2.3 times the fair value. So let's say fair value this cycle, 50. We're going to double. Oh, but this time we're not going to double because now we have ordinals. Ordinals allow there to be transaction fees so the miners can get compensated, not just from block rewards. So maybe the fair value only goes to 80K. Okay, let's just be conservative, 80. Double, that's 160. We shoot right through 160, but we're not gonna go as high this time, I don't think, because there's not as much leverage as the last two cycles, because they clamped yeah. down on you know Binance and FTX. So let's say we only get to 160 this cycle. 
Okay, then fair value will continue to accrete. The next cycle, we hit gold equivalents and gold equivalents, which is about six trillion. Everybody says 12. No, no, no. Half the gold in the world is jewelry and chalices. And that doesn't count. It's the monetary okay. value of gold at central banks and in those big coins that matter. So that's about six trillion. Six trillion, you know, divided by call it you know, 15 million coins, because there's been some lost or stolen, gives you about a 400K price. And then we we blow through that a little bit. And I guess it's to the 500K. So I, I just think that's pretty easy over the next five, six years. In a recent development, the US approved a $1.2 trillion spending bill, illustrating the enormous scale of government budgets and expenditures. USCO compares this to the potential growth trajectory of Bitcoin suggesting that its price could soar to $500,000 without trying hard. This is based on a combination of factors including technological halving events, which reduce the reward for Bitcoin mining and theoretically increase the value due to reduced supply. Mark Yusko touched on an important cultural shift with Bitcoin's integration into mainstream finance, highlighted by the significant movement of fiat money into Bitcoin. This transition is not just about technology, it's about generational wealth transfer. Yusko pointed out that the boomers currently control a substantial portion of traditional wealth, but as this wealth transitions to younger generations, we are likely to see a significant shift towards digital assets. The last cycle, when we went from 10,000 to 60,000, from November, kind of Thanksgiving to mid-January, before the famous Elon tweet, that was all because of GBTC. GBTC, which is a trust, right? was going up uh, about $10 billion. And that $10 billion has a multiplier effect. Remember, you know, you, you let off that, that I believe this year-ish, more fiat will be converted into Bitcoin than the previous 15 years put together. So over the 15 years, there's somewhere in the mid 200 billions, I don't have the exact number, of yeah. fiat that's been converted into Bitcoin. Now we have a $1.3 trillion market cap, but that isn't 1.3 trillion getting converted, right? Some got converted at pennies on the dollar. Some got converted yep. at 70,000. So that 300 billion number comes from, there's 30 trillion owned by boomers, okay? 30 trillion globally. It's invested at Merrill Lynch and UBS and all these places that had prohibited you from owning MSTR or GBTC or the miners. And when the ETF was approved, they're like, huh, I can't say that you can't invest in Uncle Larry. I mean, come on. No, He's Vanguard did. Company. Well, Vanguard did, but Vanguard, look, I, I have friends who, who run Vanguard and they made a calculated decision, I think mistaken. Or error. That yeah. They decided they want to be the one firm that says, I don't care if all you DGENs leave because you don't have any money. I have all the old people who are afraid of this stuff and they have all the money right now. So it was a calculated decision. I think it will backfire on them long-term because what's gonna happen, all of us, right? I am I am the second to last year of, of boomers. My wife's the last year. And boomers are 60 to 85 and we're all going to pass. And when we do, yeah. all of that 30 trillion is going to the next generation. And it is not going to stay at UBS and Merrill Lynch and Vanguard. It's going to go yeah. into the digital age. I think this Thanksgiving can be the best Thanksgiving ever, right? We're all yeah. going to be welcomed back. Everybody's going to love us again. And <laughs> I think the price will be well into six digits. And, yeah. and look, is it possible that it goes really crazy because the supply demand imbalance is really big. Sure. Because here's the problem. 7,300 Bitcoin needed to buy every day today on average, only 900 being created. Yeah. Okay. That's a problem. So that means someone else, someone it's listening here or somebody else has to sell, right? Well, I know I'm not selling mine. I know Pomp's not selling his and you're not selling yours. So who's selling? Well, we found out the other day there was, you know, a wallet from 2010 hadn't traded in 14 years. 
Yeah. We sold a thousand, not a lot, yeah. but a thousand. And everyone says, I'll never sell. Here's the thing. There's a price at which you'll sell some, because here's the thing. Yeah. The way the average person should think of Bitcoin is as their savings. So when do you yeah. spend your savings? When you need it, right? Do you have a college tuition payment? Do you want to buy a house? Do you want to start a business? So you, every week you should be buying. I, I was, I was on CNBC back in 2018. I don't remember what it was. And the price while it was on the show, like it was only six minutes, but it went from 10 K to 8 K while I'm there. Awesome. And Melissa Lee is like, <laughs> what, should, what should we do? Look what happened. I like, said, well, you always Smash say buy. Well, Yeah, he says, you, you always say that. I said, well, yeah, I do. Yeah. Buy it today. Buy it tomorrow. Buy it next week. Buy it next month. Don't buy it all at once. Yeah. Buy it over time and keep accumulating. Because here's the thing. John Burbank, famous hedge fund manager in San Francisco, buddy of mine, has this great line. He says, price is a liar. Price has nothing to do with value. Price is just what two people agree to exchange a small amount of good or service for. So the price of Microsoft shares is whatever it is, 270 bucks. Okay. If you have a million shares, that ain't the price. You got to get a much lower price for someone to be willing to pay to buy your million shares. So same thing is true here. As you accumulate, you don't care about the daily price. What you care about is owning a piece of the most valuable computing network the world has ever seen. And that becomes your savings. And then yeah. over time, as that savings accretes, because the value of the currency devalues. This isn't just speculation. It's supported by trends in technology adoption and investment behaviors. Moreover, the potential approval of Bitcoin ETFs could catalyze this shift by providing traditional investors a familiar structure to invest in digital assets. As we look to the future, the narrative around Bitcoin is rapidly evolving from a speculative asset to a foundational element of the next generation's financial system. In conclusion, understanding Bitcoin and its ecosystem doesn't just involve looking at its current value, but understanding its potential impact on global finance, technology, and societal structures. Thank you for joining us on Unscripted Crypto. If you enjoyed our deep dive into the Bitcoin ecosystem, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more insights.